All right, let's get started. So welcome to Software Engineering. Um, today, I'll just like to give a brief introduction of what software engineering is all about and talk about a few examples. I will skip over the organizational stuff because this is only uh, interesting in the, in the live lecture. Um, so let's get started with the question, why do we need software engineering at all? Because in fact, it's pretty easy to get started with uh, developing software. And this is quite unlike uh, operating a chainsaw in the forest where you can seriously hurt yourself without training. Everybody can basically uh, read an online tutorial and start developing software in, in most uh, cases. Um, and for that reason, it's usually also very easy to, to stay with the, with the forest metaphor, to build a little tree hut, to finish a first prototype that kind of does what you want and uh, delivers uh, a bit of, of value, so to say. Um, the problem now starts when you want to build on that, uh, on that prototype. So let's say you start out with your treehouse. You don't end up with this uh, if you start expanding uh, your treehouse. Uh, you end rather end up with something like this. So it's, uh, it's a patchwork, it's messy, it's uh, maybe a little unstable or even very much unstable. Um, so the, the whole purpose of software engineering is um, to build software that's more like the house on the left and less like the house on the right. Um, so in uh, a little less metaphor terms, that means that we want to create software which is uh, first of all well structured, that leads to the software being easy to maintain. The software should be usable and reusable, that's two different things. Reusable especially because you should be able to pick parts from the software and uh, reuse them in a different context ideally so the sh software should be modular and last but not least the software should meet its requirements whatever they are and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail what these requirements can be and to do that we want a development process which is on the one hand predictable so if any, everything goes to plan, I want to be able to, to at least make, a, make an educated guess as when to when everything will be finished. And it should also be adaptable because usually things do not go according to plan. And also last but not least, it should ideally, of course, be on time. So these are the things we, we want to achieve and this is why we do software engineering. All right, so what topics are we going to cover? We're going to uh, give a very brief uh, recap or refresher on object-oriented programming. We'll look at uh, best practices for development, like using revision control, using tests, using UML, and as we're going to especially look at different development paradigms, they're also sometimes called process models, and they fall into two big groups. One are the sometimes called classic paradigms like waterfall model, RUP, spiral model, and so on. And on the other hand, we have the so-called agile models like Scrum and extreme programming, which are kind of a more modern approach, but we will see that both of them make sense in different contexts. Um, and one other very important topic we're going to look at are design patterns. These are kind of recipes for specific programming problems that you can uh, use again and again in quite different contexts. So an example for a very simple pattern is the so-called singleton, which allows you to only have one single object of a specific type. And a more complex pattern would be the factory, which uh, for example, allows you to uh, delegate the creation of objects at runtime. We'll come, come to this later. And last but not least, we'll have a, a couple of additional topics after the main blocks regarding building and debugging, requirements engineering, open source software, and also patterns in, in user interfaces. All right. So here's an overview over the individual lectures. So we're going to, we're going to have 12 uh, blocks basically. This is not as as one-to-one -one related for the YouTube lecture, of course, but um, 
this is a, a rough overview and this is also what you will find in Moodle. All right. So um, there's two, two books that are kind of companions to the lecture. You don't need to read them. If you want a bit of background, you can read them. Of course, they're both available at the university library. One is uh, Software Engineering from Somerville. Uh, I originally used the ninth edition. It's quite possible that there's a 10th edition by now, um, but there's probably not that much that changed between the two. And there's the Design Patterns book by Gamma and uh, colleagues. That's also, um, it's more like a dictionary in which you can look up individual patterns. It's not a book you can read from uh, front to back, but this is also good to have as a reference in, in some cases. All right, if you want a bit of further reading, then we have uh, a couple of additional texts that are all, all avail available online. We have the Mythical Man Month, which is um, a rather old book and which refers to, to the myth, so, so to say that um, if you have a project that uh, needs two more months and you want uh, for, for one person and you want that project to finish in one month, then you just need to add another person and then of course the project will finish in one month. That's of course a myth. Um, in reality it will probably e take even longer if you try to do that because the people can't just be added like, uh, like numbers. Um, and this book gives a bit of background on that. Then the next one, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, is a big bit of, of background on the, the open source uh, movement. And last but not least, the Agile Manifesto is what started the, uh, the concept of Agile software development, which we're also going to talk about in, in quite some detail later on. All right, so much for why we one software engineering. Now I want to show you a few examples where software engineering did not happen or did not work. Uh, so famous um, disasters and, and accidents that were actually caused by software. So um, by now software is absolutely everywhere in every washing machine, in uh, every car, of course. Um, in, you name it, traffic control, air, air traffic control, whatever. So there's a huge potential uh, of uh, for damage. So, uh, and if you sum only the examples I'm giving in this lecture, if you sum them together, you're already at, at billions of euros that went down the drain and even uh, hundreds of people that were actually killed by these software failures. So um, let's start with a very famous one. This uh, is uh, Ariane 5, the, the European uh, carrier rocket, um, and that had its maiden flight in 1996, um, but it self-destructed after 39 seconds, taking a, f a couple of satellites with it, roughly 500 million uh, dollars of damage. And so this was, of course, a very unfortunate thing. And after a bit of analysis, later on, people figured out that um, this was indeed purely a software problem um, and actually something as, as uh, really simple as an integer overflow. So um, we had uh, sensors that delivered 64-bit uh, float velocity measurements. And at some point, this was converted to a 16-bit integer. And of course, 16-bit integer only can uh, hold values up to 32,768. So when the measurement exceeded that value, then we got an overflow um, that caused an uh, exception, which was not, not dealt with in the system. And then the entire guidance system crashed. And of course, the rocket started to go off course and had um, to be self-destructed. And um, this software was actually fully tested and, and worked perfectly fine, but it was reused from the previous rocket from Ariane 4. And uh, the older rocket was slower, which is kind of kind of logical, but in that case it was not possible for the system to create that overflow that happened uh, before. And for that reason there was no overflow handler, but the newer rocket uh, A5 was faster, so the overflow happened. 
it was never handled and we got that uh, total system crash for the whole guidance system and so uh, a lot of a lot of money went up in flames all right so one example where software engineering might have helped the next example is also very very well known this is the etheric 25 this is a radiation therapy machine for people who have for example uh, cancer and in the 1970s there were at least six accidents where people received huge radiation overdoses um, and they were either seriously injured and then basically crippled for life or they even died so um, there were at least six people and there's probably a couple of additional cases we don't know about um, the reason for this was that uh, the system had a couple of very very important safety checks but they were done in software only and that software was written by one single developer um, who never uh, introduced any formal tests and for that reason the system started to to develop a so-called race condition so let's see let's say the operator the person who actually uses the machine uh, enters some wrong intensity mode um, then the machine starts to internally change its configuration, mirrors, uh, beam blockers and whatever. Um, then the operator realizes that uh, they made a mistake and changes back to the, to the correct radiation mode. Um, and if they do that within the eight seconds the machine ta uh, takes to change internally, then the display will show the new value with the new intensity setting, but the internal setup of the machine will not change anymore because it was in the process of, of adjusting itself during these uh, eight seconds. And um, then the display will show that everything is fine, but the internal setup will, for example, still be at, at very high power. And then uh, the, the patient will get a huge radiation overdose, even if the display shows something, uh, something entirely different. So one other classic and, and actually very tragic example of how software can, can really uh, have a huge impact on things. Um, next example, this is also once again related to, to space flight. Uh, as, as you will see, space flight is obviously quite a difficult thing. Um, this is the Mars Climate Orbiter, which uh, was lo lost during its approach to, Mar uh, to Mars in 1999 and also uh, probably uh, caused damage of something like 330 million dollars and the reason here is, is particularly uh, uh, unfortunate um, because the reason is simply the metric system in a sense uh, so in the ground control software there, there were two different um, different software modules one that expected the data in uh, SI units, so metric system, meters, kilograms, and so on. And the other module, uh, B, that was sending data in imperial units, so pounds and, uh, and yards, and so on. And uh, for that reason, the, the trajectory calculations that were done by module A were not correct, obviously, because it got data in the wrong units and still calculated like it was in metric units and then the reason uh, or the the end result was simply that the probe was uh, uh, did burn up in the in the atmosphere because the trajectory was totally wrong all right so this is a particularly unfortunate case each module in itself was perfectly correct but the communication between them went wrong and the the format of the data was simply off all right, um, another more recent example, this is the Schiaparelli lander from the European Space Agency. This was a more recent example. This happened in uh, 2016, actually. So these errors obviously still happen, especially in space travel, at least. Um, still something like $100 million uh, also um, dumped onto Mars, basically. And the reason here is uh, once again an overflow error. 
So uh, after this, uh, this lander was already pretty close to the surface and had deployed its parachute, it started to spin um, for whatever reasons, a little bit of si side wind, shear winds, whatever. And that caused the uh, spin sensor on board to overflow once again. And when, when it did that, then the height the system, was, uh, the system calculated was, uh, the result was negative. This is of course nonsense, because that would mean it's below the ground. Um, but the rest of the systems interpreted that as, oh, we already have landed, so we don't need the parachute anymore and it's cut off the parachute at a height of maybe still one kilometer and then of course the whole thing just dropped like a rock and crashed into mars and uh, that's another software problem that uh, killed a, a mars probe <coughs> all right um then uh, a slightly more mundane example which is purely in software and didn't really uh, cause such a, a lot of damage. This is the so-called Morris worm. This uh, was written in 1998 and it was the first computer virus that actually can uh, uh, earns the name and this was entirely by accident. The whole thing was written as a research tool to estimate how many computers are connected to the internet. In 1998 this wasn't so many. And um, the system had kind of a heuristic. So in uh, one of seven cases, it installed a second copy of itself to, uh, to be resilient against removal because it was kind of a gray area because it was not a, a program that uh, people installed intentionally. It was designed to spread between computers. Um, of course, it wasn't designed to be malicious. The problem was with this one in se uh, one in seven cases um, because that uh, resulted quickly resulted in uh, that all of the systems had something like um, a dozen of uh, copies running uh, and were so slow that they um, uh, just stopped operating and this caused a huge slowdown of the entire uh, internet in 1998. So another software problem that actually um, resulted in people getting killed was the so-called Patriot missile disaster. This, um, the Patriot is a air defense system which is designed to, to shoot down incoming missiles. And um, in the Gulf War of 1991, this um, resulted in 28, uh, I think, American soldiers getting killed because a missile struck their camp, uh, even though they had this missile defense system installed, which was supposed to, to intercept the incoming missile. And the problem here is that the system internally um, used timestamps from, from uh, radar detection to figure out how fast the, uh, the incoming missile was and so on, but it only used 24-bit uh, precision floating point numbers. And uh, the problem now here was that the calculation was built in such a way that the conversion errors between different uh, precision types uh, accumulated over time. And so, um, uh, after the system had been running for something like 100 hours, four days in a row, the, the error was uh, something like 0 0.3 seconds. That doesn't sound uh, like so much, but if you have a missile traveling at uh, Mach 2 or whatever, far, uh, far faster than the speed of sound, then 0 0.3 seconds means uh, 600 meters of travel distance. And that means, of course, that your interceptor missile will miss the incoming missile by I don't know 600 meters so um, and there's no chance that it uh, it will uh, it will hit so and in this case this was also a software bug which really caused people people to die and again it was just a really stupidly simple uh, conversion error between floats and and other precision values and the calculation was designed uh, in such a way that it allowed the errors to, to accumulate over time. All right. Um, a, a less tragic uh, 
uh, software issue, but which is also very well known, is the so-called AT&T network crash. Uh, in 1990, the entire phone network of AT&T uh, collapsed, and so you couldn't place any calls. People uh, couldn't use their phones, uh, the internet, whatever, uh, for 11 hours, and this was also already causing something like 60 million of uh, dollars of damage. And uh, the reason here was that uh, the company wanted to <coughs> in, sorry, install a software update on the uh, telephone switches. And um, the, uh, the, what, what happened now was when the uh, switch detected an error, then it would send a so-called congestion signal to peers. So uh, to tell the other switches that this switch currently can't take any more calls, it's congested, um, then it would reset itself and then it would start forwarding calls again. Um, however, the problem now was that the other switches, after they received the congestion signal, would crash themselves when they uh, got uh, the forwarded messages in uh, part four. And then when these switches crashed, they would uh, start the whole cycle on themselves and then that failure would start to basically cascade across the entire network so the switches were rebooting all the time and when they started back up here in uh, point four then they would cause the connected switches to crash again and so on and so on and until that that was sorted out it took 11 hours, which is actually not that bad, but it, would, it still cost a lot of money uh, for the company. Um, a very recent example, which is kind of um, debatable whether it's actually a software problem, but I'll like to, to mention it here nevertheless. This is the Boeing 737 MAX, and there were two crashes of that plane within the last year or so. And the reason here is that this uh, this plane has a so-called maneuvering characteristics augmentation system (MCAS), and this uh, system itself is kind of a software patch um, because the Boeing 737 is actually uh, a 50-year-old plane design or something in in that ballpark, and the 737 Max is an update with newer engines. Uh, can see them here in this picture. They're larger and they have to be mounted in a different position on the plane and so on. Um, and that uh, can occasionally cause some uh, dangerous flight behavior. And now to counter that dangerous flight behavior, um, Boeing installed this MCAS system to um, avoid the plane uh, stalling in flight, which would also cause a crash. So this is a system that's designed to prevent dangerous flight situations. The problem, however, is for this system to, to actually work, uh, it needs to know the so-called angle of attack, so the angle of the plane with respect to, to the flight direction. Um, and the plane actually has two sensors for this angle of attack, but only one of them was apparently used by the MCAS system. And that means if that one sensor starts to create faulty values, then this MCAS system would uh, activate all the time, even if the flight situation wouldn't require it. And uh, that would, of course, uh, completely confuse the pilot because the plane would suddenly start to behave in a completely unforeseeable way. And that, in, in both cases, was likely the reason for the, for the final crash, because the plane just started behaving uh, completely uh, irrational from the point of view of the pilots. And whatever they did to, to, uh, to keep the plane stable was actually making things worse, basically. Um, so this is in part a software problem and in part also a problem of the pilots not knowing enough about the software because Boeing never really documented this, this MCAS system anywhere. So in, in a sense also a, a combination of, of software and, and hardware problems of course, but also something that might actually have been solved simply by providing better documentation. This is also something we'll later talk about a little.
All right, last but not least, um, also very well known bug is the so-called Toyota acceleration bug, uh, which uh, kind of euphemistically is described as causing unintended acceleration. But in, in reality, this means that your car would sudden, suddenly start speeding up and, and no matter what you did, it would just go on full throttle even if you press the brake if we, uh, people try uh, in, in many scenarios people uh, tried even uh, pulling the the parking brake and um, uh, stepping on the regular brakes and whatever else and the car would still like accelerate uh, to the limits of the engine and of course that usually resulted in a, in a big accident um, the exact numbers aren't clear, but uh, some estimates are that up to 89 uh, traffic deaths might have been caused by this by this bug. And um, the reason now it's hard to to trace this back to one single bug, but the analysis afterwards um, showed that the internal software of uh, Toyota of the engine control unit is basically untestable so they had something like 10,000 different global variables global variables here means that any part in the code can actually write in uh, into those variables and change them whenever it, uh, the, the code basically feels like it um, it did not have any hardware bit flip protection so that means if uh, something like cosmic ray by accident hits the uh, the memory and, and changes a bit, and this is something that does happen from time to time, then the hardware would never have been able to detect that. Then um, they used one single process for multiple tasks, and if one of those tasks uh, became stalled for whatever reasons, then for example, the other tasks couldn't run anymore. Um, their entire process management within that engine control unit was found to be um, faulty, the single process for multiple tasks thing is just one aspect of that. And so in general, the entire system had multiple single points of failure. That means um, there was no redundancy. And if one single uh, instance of, of a specific system component fails, then the entire system fails. So and all of these put together, um, this is not something usually you want to have in your engine control unit, but Toyota built that in nevertheless. Um, from the look of things, they have improved quite a lot in the, uh, in the years since, but um, uh, at the time when that happened, that uh, cast a very bad light on uh, Toyota, of course. And um, so this is also a prime example of where software engineering, proper software engineering might have helped, maybe at least a little. All right, so to summarize, software is absolutely everywhere. Um, it's yeah in your in your engine control unit, in your dishwasher, in your elevator, uh, of course in your phone, uh, in your emergency call system. Uh, for that reason, software must be reliable. And even if many of the errors we just talked about are kind of obvious in hindsight, uh, this still raises the question, how can we prevent actually making those errors in the first place? And there's no uh, perfect answer for that, of course. Uh, people make errors, that's what they do. But um, if we use uh, best practices from software engineering, then we might at least reduce the chance of such uh, obvious errors uh, being introduced at some point. All right, so that's it for the very first part. Um, so thanks for listening and uh, see you in uh, a few days, probably back here on YouTube.